Yeah, which I, I changed the title slightly, but it's the same thing. It's the same topic, yes. This sounds more fancy, a learning model. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, Professor Oni Sharkar of ISI Delhi. Uh, I was visiting him and Professor Rahul Roy uh, back in 2022. This is when the work started. Um, and it's like we have written it all up. It just needs a lot of little bit of polishing before we can submit it. So the inspiration for this work comes from uh, one of their previous papers. So I mentioned these two people, and then there is a third person, Antur Bandubata. So this paper on the one-dimensional learning from neighbors model, which came out in 2010 in the Electronic Journal of Probability, is sort of the inspiration, but then we do tweak the model that they worked on there uh, substantially. So what they worked on is a model of a discrete time interacting particle system uh, on the integer line in which uh, there are infinitely many updates allowed at any time step. So and how do these updates happen? So the way they described this, although um, when, I, when I was writing up the draft, I realized my uh, language is not so fancy. So they called these um, particles chameleons. Okay, so they're chameleons of two different colors, um, blue and red. And one chameleon inhabits each cell of the integer line, okay, each lattice point of the integer line. And each time step, uh, every chameleon is allowed to update their color according to a, a stochastic rule. And the rule is as follows. So each chameleon has a coin. The outcomes of these coins are assumed to be always IID. So IID over all the chameleons, IID over time as well. Um, let's say that a chameleon tosses a coin. Let's say a blue chameleon tosses a coin, tosses their coin, and it turns out to be a success. Then they retain their blue color. Okay. If it turns out to be a failure, then this chameleon is going to look at their two nearest neighbors and themselves. Okay. So... Uh, what they now do is they look at the proportion of successes among the, um, uh, I mean, coin toss successes among the uh, red vertices in this set. Okay, so I will demonstrate using a, a couple of diagrams. So this chameleon is looking at uh, itself and its two neighbors. And out of these three vertices, it looks at the red vertices and then it looks at the successes of those red vertices. So those red vertices may all result in failure, the, the coin tosses of those red vertices, in which case the proportion of success for those red vertices would be zero. Um, and it also looks at the proportion of successes uh, among the blue vertices in this set, okay? If the former exceeds the latter strictly, only then it will change its color from blue to red. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. The chameleons are the, the that's, why, that's why I say it. it's a fancy language where they say that the vertex themselves, the, each vertex is like a chameleon. Each vertex is a chameleon. It's Z, it's, yeah, Z, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I say they, their language is pretty fancy. Uh, there is a chameleon, yeah. There is a chameleon, yeah. And that's either blue or red. What? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to go into politics here. So, um, so here's a, a demonstration. So let's say at time step T, uh, we have these three vertices. So U uh, flanked by U1 and U2. U itself is red. And then U1 and U2 are both blue. Okay. So now, uh, if the coin toss that U performs, if this is a success, then U will retain its red color. No change will happen. So let's say that XT U1, XT U, and XT U2 are the outcomes of the coin tosses uh, performed by U1, U, and U2 respectively at time step T. Okay, so if XT U is one, then that means it's a success. And if XT U is zero, then it's a failure. So we know what happens when it is a success. So let's focus on what happens when XTU is zero, that is, it's a failure. Then at time step T plus one, the um, color of U 
will change from red to blue if and only if xt u1 plus xt u2 is at least one. What does this mean? This means that at least one of them ha has to be equal to one, which means that at least one of these two must have a successful coin toss. Because if that happens, let's say if u1 has a successful coin toss, u2 has a failed coin toss, then the proportion of blue successful coin tosses is half. It's one over two, because there are two blue vertices, okay? And uh, the proportion of red uh, successful coin toss is zero, because the only red vertex here is u, and its coin toss has resulted in a failure, okay? So in this case, the proportion of blue successes, uh, proportion, keep in mind, of blue successes is strictly bigger than the proportion of red successes, and that's why uh, the color will change from red to blue. If uh, both of these coin tosses, U1 and U2, both of them result in failure, then the proportion of blue successes is also zero. The proportion of red successes is also zero. So one, so the former does not strictly exceed the later, the latter, which is why uh, U will then retain its red color. So this is uh, um, the way the update happens. Another one is when let's say U1 is red, U2 is blue. Again, let's focus on the case where xt u is zero, meaning the coin toss associated with u uh, has resulted in a failure. In this case, when will uh, the, the color of u change from red to blue? If and only if um, xt u2 is one. Okay, so the coin toss associated with u2 is one. Why is that? It doesn't matter what happens here. The reason is if xt u2 is one, then the proportion of blue coin tosses that have resulted in successes is actually one. There is one blue vertex, therefore one uh, coin which is associated with the blue vertex, and that has resulted in a success. So the proportion of uh, blue successes will be one in this case. And whether this results in a success or failure, the proportion of red successes can never be bigger than half. Okay, so that's why uh, in this scenario, the proportion of blue successes strictly exceeds the proportion of red successes, which is why the color will get updated. Otherwise, the, otherwise meaning when xt u2 is zero, the color will remain the same. It remains red. Okay, so this is the update rule that uh, these uh, this particular paper deals with. Correct. There is no way it can. Yeah, it can uh, change to blue. Uh, yeah, that's then. Then the then the next time step that will be reflected, which is why I kept these as question marks because we are not focusing on what happens there. I am just trying to demonstrate the update rule for you. But you are right; it could be that this has changed to red at time step t plus one. That change may or may not affect you, but that will happen at time step t plus two. Okay. Say that again. At any time, the only one node gets changed? No, all of them update at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is a parallel dynamics. Correct. Do it continuous time. This is an example of a genetically constrained model, right? Okay. I don't know about, like, I haven't done, done the continuous time version, but yeah, but not sure. This uh, East model, Freddy Kenderson model. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. We flip dynamics where uh, if a constraint is satisfied, then you flip. I see. So it seems that this fits. Uh, this may, yeah. In, in, in which case, yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, I worked only in discrete time, at least so far. Mm. So the mode of, well, I guess there are other motivations out there as well. But um, when I was looking through these papers, these are the motivations that I came up with. So uh, that I could see. So there is some uh, notion of social learning, which have been studied by economists, is probably still studied by economists. And this idea was introduced in this particular paper of 1993 by Ellison and Fudenberg. This actually came out in the Political Science Journal. Uh, and it introduced this concept of social learning in which they basically studied the speed of learning. So in this case, learning is like basically the updation or the updating that's happening. 
uh, the speed of learning and market equilibrium uh, affected by social networks and whatever other institutions uh, govern the communication, govern the interaction among the participants, the agents in the model. Uh, and two other sort of follow-up papers uh, relating to this uh, original paper uh, are these two, both by Bala and Goyal, uh, 1998 and 2000. And then the, origin, the, the paper that serves as my, our inspiration, uh, that got its inspiration from this paper. This one is uh, maybe the, in, along this uh, line of work, maybe this is the first paper that is a probability paper. Uh, this came out in Advances in Applied Probability. It's by uh, Chatterjee and Zhu. And this introduced a model which talks about propagation of technology. Uh, and the idea is that, um, so there are two kinds of technologies available to every agent in the system. And um, they study two different kinds of rules. Uh, each agent uh, performs the, te the, the technology that they have been assigned at time step t and sees the outcome uh, and updates its, its technology uh, by looking at its own outcome and the outcome of the technologies of its neighbors. Okay, so the idea is pretty similar. Um, and this they refer to as technology diffusion. So, um, so those are the motivations. And now we come to our model, which we study on rooted regular trees. So it's no longer on the integer line. Uh, although this kind of model, you know, we, we are sort of starting to work on lattices or lattice-like graphs more um, uh, starting from this year. So uh, I'll denote by T sub M, uh, the rooted uh, tree in which each vertex, including the root, uh, has precisely M children. Um, M is any positive integer period than or equal to two. And I'll refer to by C sub T of U as the color of the vertex U in T sub M at time step T. Okay, so again, we are, we are dealing with discrete time. So T will vary over the set of non-negative integers. And um, it's either blue or red. So the color, uh, uh, the options for color are blue or red. Okay, so we assume that uh, initially we start with a, uh, an assignment of colors to the vertices, that is IID. Okay, so C not U, U belonging to T sub M. This collection is uh, IID and this distribution is like this. So C not U is bl uh, blue with probability uh, pi naught and red with probability one minus pi naught for some pi naught in uh, zero one. Okay, so here I just sort of wanted to, um, you know, even though there will be questions also at the end of the talk, but I wanted to kind of uh, stop and uh, mention that we don't really know what happens if we don't start with an IID collection of random variables. We uh, don't even know if, uh, if we retain the assumption of independence, but we get rid of the assumption of identically distributed, even then what happens? So this is something that's worth checking out. Um, so, um, how does so we have to talk about our update rule now, which is, as I was mentioning at the beginning of the talk, a little bit of tweaked version of uh, what um, uh, Rahul Roy, Anish Sharkar, and Andhra Bandhubhata were dealing with in their paper. Um, so we uh, have a policy function, F, uh, which maps from this set. This set is nothing but the set of all non-negative integers uh, uh, less than or equal to M. So M is any, as I said, M is this, uh, the degree, not the degree, the number of children of each vertex of the tree we are considering. So this policy function maps from this set to uh, the, the interval zero one. Uh, so we basically a bunch of probabilities. And we assume that this function is symmetric, uh, which means that F of K plus F of M minus K is one for every K in uh, this set. And this symmetry assumption, um, we can see that it's um, for many commonly uh, studied functions. This this does apply, and in fact, the main the main policy function that we uh, deal with in our paper also satisfies this condition. Uh, I think it's merely a nice condition. If you get rid of it, you will get some somewhat different results. Uh, but maybe the analysis won't be significantly harder if you, even if you do get rid of it. Not sure. Um, 
So henceforth in the talk, for a, a given vertex u in the tree, I will denote its children by u1, u2, so on up to u sub m. And so we, what does the policy function uh, signify? So it's this conditional probability. So what does it say? It says that conditioned on there being precisely uh, k many blue children of u at time step t, what is the probability that at time step t plus one, the color of the parent vertex u will be blue? Okay, this is what the this is uh, what we capture by f of k. Okay, so for each k in this set uh, zero one through m. So uh, you specify the policy function and then you perform the analysis uh, of the of this. You can call it a tree automaton if you want. Um, using this policy function. But we'll focus on one particular policy function uh, as we shall see in the next couple of slides. Um, and I just mentioned that, uh, so the, up, the this updates happen independently. So you would condition on whatever you see at time step t. And uh, when you are updating, uh, looking at your children, you don't take into account what happens to the other vertices. You just update according to this rule and it's independent of everything else. Okay, so, uh, so now I mentioned the update rule that we, uh, we particularly focus on in our work, which is the absolute majority update rule. Um, so this involves a couple of collections of random variables, which I must define now. So for each uh, vertex u, uh, we have uh, a Bernoulli random variable x sub t of u associated uh, with it. So this will basically signify the coin toss that's been performed by the vertex u at time step t. Okay, so that's the significance of x sub t of u. Uh, x sub t of u, uh, the entire collection, so by that I mean uh, when you vary u over all the vertices of t sub m and you vary t over all the non-negative integers, this entire collection is iid and each with the distribution Bernoulli p. Okay, so this p will serve as our parameter uh, that we will be interested in, so uh, in our model. Okay, so, so for some p in uh, close zero one, and uh, we have another uh, collection of random variables, uh, also Bernoulli. These are Bernoulli half random variables, y sub t of u. Again, as you uh, take the entire collection, varying u over all the vertices of t sub m and t over all non-negative integers, this entire collection is iid. And uh, the, the final point to keep in mind is that, is that this entire collection, so just, so I will come to the significance of YTU in the next slide, uh, but what the, to keep in mind that this collection, which is a collection of random variables that happen at time step T is independent of whatever has happened up to time step T. So it's independent of this. Okay, so this is the set of the colors of the vertices of uh, the tree up to time step t. Okay, so, so now I talk about the rule itself now that I have defined the quantities that are involved in defining this rule. So as before, u1 through um and um denote the children of u, and we are going to condition on the colors of these children at time step t. Okay, uh, so then how do I define the distribution for the color of u, the parent vertex, at time step t plus one. So this is how it goes. So what does this mean? So summation i running from one through m, xt of ui, remember xt of ui is the outcome of the coin toss that is being performed by the vertex ui at time step t. It is either zero, in which case it's a failure, or one, in which case it's a success, okay? This is the indicator function that the, that the uh, color of the, ch the child ui at time step t is blue. So what does this mean? This is one only when the color of ui is blue and the coin toss performed by ui at time step t is a success. Okay, so this counts the number of blue successes among the children of u at time step t. Okay, similarly, this counts the number of red successes among the children of uh, u at time step t. So blue successes simply referring to uh, coin tosses performed by blue vertices resulting in success. Okay, so I'm just uh, abbreviating it and calling it blue success. Okay, so the color of u, the parent vertex at time step t plus one will be blue 
if the number of blue successes is strictly bigger than the number of red successes among its children, so absolute majority, so you're looking at which one exceeds the other, okay? It will still be blue if these two are equal, but then you have a tie-breaking um, random variable. So YTU is another coin, but this is a fair coin, okay? So XTUIs were all Bernoulli P. Okay, so these were all Bernoulli P, but YTUs are Bernoulli half. So these are basically uh, tie-breaking points that, so if uh, these two numbers are the same, then U performs uh, a fair coin toss just to decide with probability half, whether it's gonna be blue or it's gonna be red, okay? And otherwise it's red. So what does otherwise mean? It simply means the number of blue successes is strictly less than the number of red successes, okay? The policy function is, yeah, it comes out of this. I'm, I haven't like defined it like very clearly here, but it will, I'll define it in the next slide. Um, so yeah, I have just, uh, this is like mentioning in words uh, what I have written here uh, mathematically. And so the policy function, oh, okay. Let me just uh, demonstrate uh, with a couple of pictures and then we talk about the policy function. So let's say this is, a, this is the scenario at time step t. I have kept this blank because it doesn't matter what it was at time step t. Because um, unlike in the previous model here, there is no retention of color. You are simply deciding your color, looking at uh, your, the, colors of, the colors and coin toss outcomes of your children. Okay, so this some, it, was, it was some color at time step t. And at time step t, uh, so this is m equal to three, so it has three children. Uh, two of the children were blue and uh, one child uh, was red, okay? So now uh, how do you decide what's going to happen to the parent vertex U at time step T plus one? So one possibility is that um, this, is, this results in a failure. At least one of them results in a success, in which case the number of blue successes will be, uh, so this is the case number of blue success will be strictly bigger than the number of red successes, okay? Another possibility is that all three of them results in, result in success, in which case there are two blue successes, one red success. Again, uh, the color of the parent vertex will become blue in that case, okay? Uh, another possibility is that the one of them is a failure, the other one is a success, and this one is a success. Then what happens? You have one blue success, one red success, and so you have to bring in the tie-breaking uh, coin toss to decide whether the, the parent vertex will be blue or not, okay? So that's this case, okay? And the final case is that all three of them are failures, in which case the number of blue successes is zero, number of red successes is zero, and again, you bring in the tie-breaking tie random variable to decide if it's gonna be blue or red, okay? So, and here you have uh, the sort of the symmetrical, the opposite uh, scenario where you have um, one blue child, two red children. So now uh, one possibility is that both of these are failures, okay? And this one is a success, in which case the number of blue successes is one, number of red successes is zero. So there's a strict inequality there. Uh, another possibility is that this is a success, Precisely one of them is a success, the other one is a failure. So uh, now we have, have to bring in the tie-breaking random variable. And the final case is again what we saw in the previous slide as well. All three of them are failures, in which case uh, the number of blue success is uh, zero, number of red success also zero. So again, you uh, toss the tie-breaking coin to the side. Okay, so these are the update rules. Of course, you can look at the other uh, possible cases, all blue, all red. I just wanted to demonstrate these two. So what's the policy function now? Um, so you, we are ultimately, so if you recall the policy function definition, uh, which was this, this conditional probability. So you can, so F of K would be uh, the probability that uh, U is assigned the color blue at time step T plus one, conditioned on it having precisely K blue children at time step T. Okay, so here what you can do is, so we condition on this event, but in particular, we, uh, we fix, let's say the, 
this is just for notational convenience. Uh, we fix uh, the first K children to have the color blue and the remaining M minus K children to have the color red. Then the policy function that I refer to as F absolute. So F absolute of K, this is simply the probability that this sum, which is the number of blue successes is strictly bigger than this sum, which is the number of red successes, plus the probability where the two are equal and the fair coin toss results in a success, okay? So this gives you the absolute majority policy function. And you can check that the symmetric condition that I previously mentioned, which is f of k plus f of m minus k equal to one for every k is satisfied in this case. So now I come to the analysis um, that we want to do with this. So in some sense, we want to see what happens in the limit. Uh, so, so because we start with an IID initial distribution, again, it's a question what happens if we get rid of this assumption. Uh, so the distribution, the joint distribution of the colors will remain IID throughout. Um, and let's say that it's distrib this distribution is given by, uh, so C sub T of U, if you recall, so this is the color of U at, at time step T. This is, let's say, blue with probability pi sub T and uh, a red with probability one minus pi sub T. Uh, then, um, so, and what is the probability that, uh, that U has precisely uh, K blue children at time step T. So from this uh, and from the independence assumption, uh, we know that that's simply going to be this uh, binomial probability. So you choose K, uh, K children out of the M children of, of U and assign to them uh, the color blue with probability pi sub T and the remaining one minus pi sub T uh, to the power M minus K that's for the red, the red children. So then pi sub t plus one, which is the probability that the, uh, that u receives the color blue at time step t plus one, this is going to be, so now basically we are looking at the unconditional probability where this f absolute k is, so this thing, this is uh, the, the conditional probability. So conditioned on uh, you having k blue children at time step t. So this gives you the unconditional probability. So the conditional times this probability. Okay, so, so now um, if I uh, define this function, so this function has the same form as what we see here, except that, you know, pi sub t has been replaced by x. So g absolute of x is this function. So then the recurrence relation that we saw in the previous slide simply boil, boils down to pi sub t plus one is, uh, this should be g absolute, I forgot, g absolute of pi sub t, okay? Uh, so we are interested in whether a uh, limit of pi sub t exists as t goes to infinity. And if it does, then because this is, you know, this is a nice polynomially behaving function. So uh, as you take uh, t to infinity on, on, on both sides of this, you ultimately get pi is equal to g absolute of pi, which means that pi has to be, in that case, the limit has to be a fixed point of G absolute, okay? And it has to lie between zero and one. So we are interested in investigating all fixed points of uh, G absolute in zero one. <coughs> um, so a couple of things that we can say immediately because of the symmetry assumption, uh, because F absolute satisfies the symmetry condition uh, is that one is that pi equal to half will be a fixed point for every P Remember that P is the parameter that is associated with the, uh, the coin tosses. So P is the success, the success probability of every coin toss, um, every coin toss associated with every vertex. Uh, and another thing is that pi is a fixed point of G absolute, uh, if and only if one minus pi is a fixed point of G absolute. Okay, so there is this symmetric structure that we are dealing with. So now comes the main result of our work which is that for every positive integer m greater than or equal to two half. If pi equal to half is a fixed point, what does it say about the model? Half is red, half is blue? Uh, so, so it means that, um, yeah, so it will converge, but the, it will be like um, each vertex, so IID, uh, it's like uh, it's blue with probability half, red with probability half. It's because of this definition. So you have this, right? So eventually it will be like pi one minus pi. And so if pi is half, then that's the only possibility, yeah. 
directly correlated. So how do you mean by correlated? So ID by or... Yeah, that will be ID by. But the so the the color of a vertex at time step t plus one will be related to the color of its children at time step t. So it's not it's not as if the independence is across time. At any time step, the whole joint distribution would be IIT. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so, so for every m, we can find a p of m. So this is a uh, quantity between zero and one, such that uh, g absolute has a unique fixed point for all p less than or equal to p of m, and it has multiple fixed points uh, for all. In fact, we can talk about how many there are. Uh, for all p uh, strictly bigger than p of m. Okay, so this is, uh, so, and we proved this. So uh, the main work was basically this result, uh, which talks about how the, uh, the, fun the curve G absolute looks like. Uh, so I say m strictly bigger than four, that's because uh, we, uh, we needed this assumption just for technical reasons, and then m less than or equal to four we dealt with separately because those were easy to deal with. Uh, so that's why I mentioned m greater than four, but it covers all the cases. Um, so for every positive integer m bigger than four, and for each fixed p in zero one, uh, again p is this parameter. Uh, the function g absolute is first strictly convex up to half, okay, so over the interval zero to half, it's strictly convex, and then it becomes strictly concave, okay? So this uh, is crucial to um, concluding this result, okay? So we will focus on um, first taking a look at how we prove the second result. So, um, so I hope I have enough time. Um, so it starts with just, uh, and again, I, Sometimes I've skipped this G absolute because a lot of this, um, uh, a lot of the initial analysis also goes through for general policy functions that um, satisfy the symmetry condition. But of course, eventually, when you want to say anything specific, then you have to deal with, then you have to work with one particular policy function. So, uh, so G absolute prime you can write as so, and this is like we are we are just looking at the double derivative of the function G absolute and trying to see how it behaves, how the sign of it behaves over the zero one. Okay, so. We begin with the derivative of G absolute, which you can write in this format. And that just, you know, we just differentiate the uh, form of G absolute and we get it from there. So that's a straightforward thing. Uh, so X is a binomial M minus one comma small X random variable. If you apply this idea, sort of iterate it again, uh, then when you look at G double prime X, you can write this, uh, write it in this format. So you can see you have applied the this same idea twice here. And y here is a binomial m minus two comma x random variable. <coughs> okay. So uh, because of this, so if you expand this expression, uh, you get uh, this. Okay. So we are interested in looking at, um, in considering the sign of this and eventually the sign of this entire submission. Okay, so to that end, we will in the next slide to just give you a heads up. Uh, in the next slide, we will rewrite this in a certain form. So, and this is where this so so far we haven't needed symmetry condition. So now, if we apply the symmetry condition and uh, simply look at so instead of looking at the sum from zero to m minus two, we sort of look at it halfway, and then the next half we. Uh, replace uh, each of these by one minus F absolute of uh, M minus J minus two and stuff like that. Okay, so we make use of the symmetric condition there. And if we do that, then we are able to uh, write G, G double or G absolute double prime X in this form, where now the sum runs from zero to this, um, you know, it's hard to say this, but basically it's halfway. You go halfway and then half of it is left. And uh, because of this modification, you now have uh, a term of this form, okay? And you can see that if we are able to show that uh, this quantity, 
okay, this quantity within the curly braces is greater than or equal to zero. It's, it's non-negative for every j between zero and this halfway uh, mark. Then uh, whenever x is less than or equal to half, what happens? This quantity is non-negative when, when x is less than or equal to half. Whereas when x is bigger than half, this will be uh, non-positive. And that's why we will get that uh, g double prime, uh, g absolute double prime x is strictly, or is at least non-negative uh, for x between zero and half and is non-positive for, for x between half and one. And that's why, that's how we get um, this result, that it's strictly convex uh, on zero half and strictly concave on half one. Okay, so uh, that's what I uh, sort of try to explain next, how we analyze the sign of, of this quantity, because uh, trying to do this sort of brute force was br bringing in a lot of complications. So um, the idea for computing uh, this quantity is uh, sort of lies in um, what I want to call um, as looking at vertices as pivots, okay? So there are, there are some vertices that will play a pivotal role in uh, determining, in switching the color of the parent vertex, and that's what we do. So uh, to explain that uh, better. So first of all, uh, again, recall that what is F absolute of J? So this is the, prob the conditional probability that U gets the color blue conditioned on uh, it having uh, j many blue children at time step t. Okay? And uh, this is given by uh, these two quantities. So this is, as you remember, so if, if, you, if you recall, that we are as assuming that uh, the first uh, j many um, children have color blue at time step t, and the remaining m minus j have color red at time step t then this is the number of uh, uh, blue successes. This is the number of red successes. So either it is it, uh, either the, so this is, this is the case where the number of blue successes is strictly bigger than the number of red successes. And this is where they tie and you break the tie using this fair coin. Okay, so similar expressions will hold for uh, F absolute J plus one and F, F absolute J plus two. You will just change these indices, okay? So for this case, for example, it will run from one through J plus one and this will run from j plus two to m and so on, okay? So when computing this, um, this quantity, uh, we basically split things into a few different cases and that uh, actually helps us eliminate a lot of possibilities. So for example, uh, case one and case seven, turns out that they leave no contribution when you look at, uh, no contribution to this, to this computation, okay? So, um, I don't know if I uh, can explain the whole thing, but I tried to give an example of um, how uh, we do this, um, this kind of um, uh, determining how much contribution each case leaves. So for example, case two is where the number of, uh, so this is the number of blue successes uh, up to the jth vertex. So, I mean, uh, the number of, uh, yeah, the number, so, summation I running from one to j x t u i. This is the outcome of the coin toss um, of the u i of the i th child. And that is equal to this plus two. Now, uh, in this case, we have, uh, we want to, uh, so we are interested in looking at this and this, and when can those two things happen? Um, so, Summation identifying from one through j x t u i. We want to say when that might exceed uh, summation i running from j plus one through m x t u i. Okay, which is this sum. Okay, and this can exceed exceed this under this condition if and only if uh, this sum. So this is strictly less than two. Okay, and the other possibility is that. This is equal to this, okay? Again, this is summation I running from J plus one through M X T U I. So this can, this can be exactly equal to this if and only if this sum is equal to two, which happens if and only if each of them is equal to one. Okay, so we see that the contribution of case two uh, to the computation of F absolute J uh, is given by these two parts. One is where, as I said, 
this is the this is the part where there is strict inequality. Um, so where x to u j plus one and x to u j plus two sum to less than two. So that those are, those are the three possibilities. Or else they are both equal to one. And now you have to bring in the the tie breaking fair coin toss. Okay. So. But if we check the other two uh, quantities, so here ultimately we're interested in uh, computing the effect on the contribution of case two to this entire expression. So we must also take into account what happens in case of f absolute j plus one and f absolute j plus two. And for those, we can check easily that uh, this entire probability uh, is incorporated uh, in those expressions. So for f absolute j plus one, this entire probability is there. Um, in f absolute j plus two as well, that entire probability is there. So if you now uh, just combine the contributions uh, of case two to this expression, you end up with a far simpler expression down here. So I'm not going through the steps, but you can check them. Um, so this, um, this p squared simply comes from the probability that these two are equal to one. Okay. So, um, Ultimately, the idea is that you combine the effects, the contributions of all these uh, cases uh, to, uh, to this expression. And this is what you get, which is kind of um, uh, like a sort of looks quite technically hard to deal with. But then uh, if you just sit down and uh, uh, break these things up, it actually works out uh, not too difficult. Uh, doesn't turns out to be not too difficult. And uh, we, were, we are ultimately able to show that each of these differences uh, in each of these two lines is strictly positive for uh, each P in zero one. And now if we incorporate this, so that, that makes this expression strictly positive. Uh, again, when we are uh, in this range of values of G. And then when we go, go back, uh, so the, so we wanted to, get the sign of this quantity. So we have now shown that uh, for every j in this range, this is strictly positive. Uh, so that when x is greater than, x is less than or equal to half, this is uh, non-negative. Um, and that's why you get g double prime x in that case strictly positive. Um, at x equal to half, it is zero. And uh, when x is strictly bigger than half, then this is negative, and that's why g double prime x turns out to be uh, strictly negative. Okay, so that proves this result um, that it's strictly convex in zero half and strictly <coughs> concave in half one. But we still need to uh, so we still need one more step uh, to show uh, this the first result. So. Pictorially, the curve uh, G absolute should look like one of these two, okay? So because um, it's, it's strictly convex in zero half, so it can intersect uh, the line Y equal to X at at most two points, okay? And then because it's strictly concave in half one, it can intersect uh, again the line y equal to x at at most two points. Besides, because of the symmetry assumption, we know that half is a fixed point. So there that intersection will definitely happen. So this is one possibility where you do have, oh, another thing is because of symmetry as, uh, as I mentioned before, pi is a fixed point if and only if one minus pi is a fixed point. So either you will have a situation like this. So uh, here it's convex and it has intersected uh, y equal to x at these two points, alpha and half. And here it's concave. Again, it has intersected at two points, half and uh, one minus alpha. And it's alpha and one minus alpha, as I mentioned, they are both fixed points. Or it could be that it doesn't intersect uh, y equal to x before half, doesn't intersect after half. So there is a unique fixed point at half. Okay. So now... It is, so we have to notice here that, uh, so again, this uh, we can just compute and see that at the, at zero, G absolute of zero is strictly positive. Uh, I think for P less than one, uh, for P equal to one, it's, uh, it's gonna be zero. Um, so let's focus on that P uh, less than one. So, uh, so here it starts above the line Y equal to X 
Therefore, the first time it will intersect the line uh, y equal to x, it must be traveling downward. Okay, so the slope here of g absolute has to be less than the slope of y equal to x, so less than one. And if it is then coming up, if, if it is intersecting half after, at half after that, then this curve must be coming above y equal to x at x equal to half. So that tells you that this, the, the uh, slope of g absolute here must be strictly bigger than one. On the other hand, if you look at this picture, then it goes, the curve g absolute x travels from above to below y equal to x at half. Therefore, the slope here would be less than or equal to one. Okay, so this gives you a necessary sufficient condition for uh, G absolute to have a unique fixed point at half. Okay, so that happens if and only if the, its slope at half is less than or equal to one. So the next thing that we show is, uh, so it suffices to show that there is some P of M that you know, I promised in the main result uh, between zero and one says that the Derivative of G absolute at half is less than or equal to one for each P less than P of M. And it's strictly bigger than one for each P above P of M. So that's why here it will be the unique fixed point regime. Here it's gonna be multiple fixed points, three fixed points regime. And uh, this we uh, achieve by showing that the, G, the derivative of G at half is a strictly increasing function of P. Um, and there, uh, and that we show using uh, a technique that's like that's similar to the proof of Rousseau's formula, but I have I've not gone into the details of that. So, um, so questions that we haven't been able to address. So we dealt with absolute majority, but if you recall uh, in the paper that inspired this work, they dealt with uh, proportional majority. A proportional majority, when we tried to incorporate that, seemed to be a lot more complicated. Uh, to uh, do anything analytically about, but it would be nice to see if we can do something about it um, in our tree setup. Uh, another thing is that, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, in this paper, uh, the particle, every particle is allowed to retain its color under certain conditions. But in our case, we are not doing that. If there is a tie between the number of blue successes and the number of red successes, then we toss a fair coin to decide what the updated color of the parent vertex should be. But this makes things slightly simpler is what we feel because it keeps the, um, keeps the IID setup going if we start with an IID initial distribution. This will probably not be the case uh, if we do allow particles to retain color. So this is something that, uh, Professor Anisharkar and I are currently looking, we have started looking into. Uh, and we have only been able to say anything about general policy functions for very small values of the number of children M. So what happens for higher values of M? Um, can we say something for general policy functions regarding the number of fixed points of the corresponding uh, function G? Uh, and in general, I guess, moving out of rooted regu regular trees, uh, looking at um, more general trees, looking eventually at Galton Watson trees, uh, what would that give us? So we don't know any of that. So those would be some of the open questions in addition to the open questions that I mentioned in between the talk. Um, I guess I also finished a little ahead of time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. Are there any questions? Yes. So, if there are many fixed points, uh, is there a fixed point that shows some clustering of blues, clustering of reds? Uh, so, that happen? And what do other fixed points look like? Right. So, um, yeah, it, it would be nice to know if that's uh, something like that happens or not. So, I think um, in case of uh, there, this paper, uh, they, I think, showed that um, eventually they will be like kind of all red or all blue, uh, the equilibrium uh, solution, like the, the limiting distribution becomes something like that. Um, here, we don't know uh, much like anything like that. So 
Yeah, but again, this retention of color might give us something different. If we, instead of this coin, to, this fair coin toss, if we do some retention of color, it might give us something different, significantly different. So, yeah. I think you already mentioned this uh, mm -hmm. extension to uh, Elton Watson trees mm -hmm. and so on. So here the M is fixed. Right. Um, uh, is there any difficulty that you anticipate if you have the recursive distributional equation mm -hmm. operate over a random number of uh, m? Uh, but uh, so, so I think there is a. If, uh, forgive I, me if I, I'm I, saying this. I might be saying this wrong because mm. you know I don't really work on. Um, I think like I haven't really so far done much about random processes like this on random environments, but I think. What I think what you're thinking about is basically averaging over uh, the, dist the offspring distribution in Galton Watson trees. Uh, writing right? the uh, d distributional equation in such right. a way it that you recognize a, yeah. that M is random. Correct. Yeah. And then so, you'll get the. Uh, yeah, point but then equation. that's, I think, the annealed version, but probably you would have to look at. I think, I'm not thinking in terms of uh, random environments or anything of the sort, but mm -hmm. maybe just an no, the graph. equation you can get, but. Hmm. Uh, is is it enough to look at um, this the this averaged over quantity or this this function? I, I'm not sure. So there seems to be probably some difficulties if we just uh, yeah, yeah. If you're able to resolve that, uh, mm -hmm. then you might be able to say what is because the Galton Watson tree mm -hmm. would be an appropriate uh, local weak limit on of a particular. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Okay. Uh, model of a mm -hmm. finite graph. Mm -hmm. Here, one thing that seems a little odd is that you're looking at only neighbors of children. Uh, right. Neighbors okay. are children and then the parent adopts that. Right. Whereas you would like to look at all neighbors. Ah, but okay. you'll be able okay. to tie the two things up um, right. Right. by uh, recognizing yeah, that that is right. a... I don't know. But again, I'm not sure, but it seems from discussions with, uh, you know, more like the, the actual experts in, in all these areas that um, if when you have like this both directional dependence, probably things become more complicated. Like when the color will depend on the parent and the children is that's what you're suggesting, right? Yeah. But, but yeah, definitely more realistic in well, many ways. One because if you think of that as being free, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for the one dimensional, maybe they're, um, I think they, they do an analysis using um, random walks. So this is very different from like what we could manage on the tree. But yeah, it would be nice to look at that, yeah. So how much is known in, uh, in two dimensions? For instance, Luca was mentioning uh, these uh, whole series of kinetically constrained uh, uh, yeah, models I, by uh, uh, so, Cristina Toninelli, who's been working on that. So they're, they're, they're geometrically very complicated, but is anything, uh, you can do something here? So when I think of these things, um, so, I, so I feel like maybe the language is different across different disciplines. When I think of these things, I think of them as automata. Okay, and then what little I have studied on lattices, these are these probabilistic cellular automata. And uh, for them, it seems uh, that finding results of this sort, basically, basically asking for ergodicity is quite hard. So, so I have a very recent paper in EJP, which took a lot of work to establish ergodicity for a probable six cellular automaton that comes out of a percolation game. Um, here, there is no game involved, but again, this would give rise to, you know, some corresponding PCA on the lattice and that, that Understanding its ergodicity may be a pretty non-trivial thing. Yeah. Yeah. Question. Not that's saying all the speakers think about the one